Good afternoon, sir. Can you see and hear me? Yes, I can. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Mr. Parker, could we pick up where we left off by looking at poll 9282? You recall we've looked at some documents on um, remote access from 2001, 2002, and we're now moved to 2004. Uh, can you see that um, uh, this document is entitled Customer Service Operational Change Procedure? The abstract of it says that it describes the procedure for operational changes where the changes are made to the live operation. And it's dated the 18th of March, 2004, as version one. And the contributors um, to it are uh, you and Mr. Peach. Yes? Yep. Uh, does that mean that you wrote it, or did Mike Stewart uh, and or Mick Peach write it? Uh, I think it was the latter. Mike and Mick would have written it. I would have just con con contributed ideas or s suggestions. I see. And uh, can you remember what the um, reason for the necessity for this document was? Um, other than ensuring that the process was correctly documented, no. Was, did this represent a change in process or was this recording what happened? Without rereading the whole document, I'm not sure whether it was a change or not. Can we just look um, to, to maybe help you answer that question at page six? Can you see from the introduction, it appears to be a description of existing process rather than highlighting change to a process? I think that's right, yes. And then can we go to page seven, please? And you'll see that it says in the first line, anyone can raise an, um, an OCP, except yes. those who have logged on to the SSC website using the OCP view user. What, what does that mean, please? Can you remember now? Um, when logging on to the SSC website, you needed to supply a username password, um, and OCP view was, I believe, one of, one of those usernames. And why couldn't you raise one if you had logged on using OCP view? My assumption is from this sentence that, that it was a read-only user so that, so that you couldn't um, interfere or change OCPs. Um, I would also say that when we said earlier this is, a, this is not, a, not a changed document or from the previous one, my memory of the previous one was that OCRs were raised on paper at that time, whereas this reflects the fact that they were being raised via the SSC website. I see, I so understand. I, but apart from that, I doubt there's a great deal of difference. And then if we can go to page nine, please. At the end of this section on generating an OCP, it says, note, an OCP is raised in order to make a change to the live system. If the change is likely to affect a system build, then the relevant part of the form must be set to yes. If the change is being made to the system in order to overcome an operational deficiency, which should be permanently fixed in the system code, then there must be a call raised to report the problem and the call reference added um, to the OCP. Was there any monitoring in place at Fujitsu to ensure that those who um, had power to access the live system acted in accordance with this policy? Um, there was no constraint. It was just you were expected and uh, 
to use the process. I don't know of any way that you could stop people from not using that process. What about retrospectively? Were, was any audit done to ensure that any changes that were made, whether using this OCP system or not, were monitored for errors, um, regression, or unintended consequences? Um, certainly after making any change you would be uh, looking at the system carefully to make sure as you say there's no regression or or adverse impact to the system um, that 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 would be standard process that would just be due just be due diligence really that's on an individual basis mm. um, I'm looking at, or I'm asking about um, more a system-wide uh, approach. Um, I don't think I was aware of a system-wide approach, no. Um, can we turn, um, please, to FUJ 0013-8355? Mr. Beer, before we do that, could we just go back to the first page, please? Yes, I, please. I don't want to make any point that you're going to cover, but unless I'm... Um, Mr. Parker, if you see um, just below um, your name and Mr. Peach's, there's the heading external distribution, and we have the name John Bruce Post Office Limited. Now, I may have missed it, but I don't think in the last document we looked at about these processes, there was an external distribution of the post office. Have I got that right? I'm sorry, I don't, don't remember. All right, oh, that, that's fine. But on this occasion, clearly there was. So Indeed. that from this moment on, the post office w w were aware of this document on the face of it. Yes. And do you know who Mr. Bruce was? Uh, I remember the name, but I don't know his his position within uh, the post office. All right, thank you. Sorry, Mr. Beer, but I just wanted to follow that up slightly. So, yes, uh, can I follow up your follow-up and um, look at um, page two of the document, please? Yeah. And scroll down, please. Um, we can see, the I think, maybe the purpose for which a... Um, the document may have been uh, shared with the post office because under the bottom section of that table it says for optional review or issued for information um, and again the name of Mr Bruce from uh, post office uh, limited can you help us what does that um, optional review mean um, when the document went out for optional uh, review, the person may or may not re return uh, like comments, comments on it. If you were a re reviewer, you had to return a no comments document. I see. Uh, was that a mandatory review? Uh, for a mandatory re review of a document, yes, you had to return no comments. And so an optional reviewer here, Mr. Bruce, would be sent the document, but it, it wasn't mandatory for him to make a return. Correct. The optional doesn't apply to whether or not the document was sent to him. That's correct, yes. And issued for information, is that self-explanatory, i.e. you're just getting this after we have written it? Yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, can we go, please, um, to FUJ 0013-8355? Um, this is a, a new species of document that we're looking at w with you. It's uh, called a WI. Can you recall what those are? Uh, those are work instructions um, which were entered and maintained on the on the SSC website. Can you briefly explain what um, the purpose and function of a work instruction is, please? 
Um, it was there to uh, pro to provide information to uh, diagnosticians on how a, a particular task should be achieved or what the expectations were for standards of use. And was it a, an internal SSC document then? I think... Uh, they were only ever raised by SSC members. I don't remember whether people outside the SSC could see them. I suspect they could. But the target audience were um, members SSC, of the SSC diagnosticians? Yes, indeed. Um, if we just read it, um, uh, the title is Data Correction. It, it was authored in its first version by you. Um, this is version 18 we're um, uh, looking at. Um, and the details are GDPR regulations require that access to personal data remains within the European Union and PCI data security standards mandate physical security restrictions must be applied where update access is allowed to user data. Presumably you wouldn't have been writing that, is that right, in 2011? Yeah, I don't believe those are my words. They're not my style. I probably, I may have lifted those from a security, security document. I was thinking more about um, whether in 2011 you would have been referencing the GDPR at all. Quite true, yes. I mean, that would have been, that would have been too early for that, yes. And so we can't tell from this, the 18th edition of this document, what is your text? What is the text of those between versions 2 to 17 and that which is Mr Woodley's text in version 18? Yes. Is that right? That is correct, yeah. Um, Moving on a paragraph, uh, sorry, just at the end of um, the first paragraph, the responsibility for data correction is vested with the SSC, although ISD sometimes acts under SSC authorization. What was ISD? That was the Belfast operations. That was another, another acronym used for them, for them later on. Okay. Corrections to live system data must be authorised via account change control and auditable any correction requiring apps uproll is to be witnessed by a second member of the ssc both names must be recorded on the um, change control for audit purposes uh, given the documents we've looked at to date why was this work instruction um, necessary um I think the idea was to just clarify for SSC members to make it clearer to them so that they didn't have to, to look at various uh, disparate documents. What would they have done between 2000 then and 2000, uh, September 2011 when this document was first created? They would have had to refer to various, uh, various documents to get the overall picture as it pertained to the SSC. You see at the top it says that this work instruction is waiting for approval by Mark Wright and shouldn't be used. Mm -hmm. Why was it um, still in February 2021 waiting approval by Mark Wright and shouldn't be used? I don't know. Uh, if you just read through it um, to yourself, just to re-familiarise yourself with it. Okay, yes, got that. And then as you scroll down to change control. Thank you.
Yep, okay. Is there anything in there that you can read that might um, explain or justify why the work instruction was awaiting approval by uh, Mark Wright? No, no. Nothing there is obvious to me, no. Going back to the top of the page, in the second paragraph under details, uh, corrections to live system data must be authorised via account change control and auditable. Does that suggest that still at this date, um, when you wrote it in 2011 and when Mr Woodley last updated it in 2021, that there wasn't any automated system of um, secure access and um, auditing? No, that, I don't remember whether I wrote that sentence or not, but I mean, um, any change of that type to the system, we would want to be auditable in some way. I don't think that says that um, changes were not, were not actually auditable previously. Uh, it continues, any correction requiring APSUP role. What was the APSUP role, please? The APSUP role was a um, elevated permission uh, that members of the SSC could uh, invoke in order to uh, view or change certain information within a, a database. So it was more than our standard permissions. Uh, was it up to them to determine whether they uh, used that enhanced facility? It was, yes. Was there any restriction on them using that enhanced facility? Um, no, there wasn't to my knowledge. It says that um, any use of the apps up is to be witnessed uh, by a, um, sorry, any correction requiring apps up is to be witnessed by a second member of the SSC. The um, four eyes approach that we had seen in the earlier documents didn't restrict that requirement to the use of the APSOP facility, did they? Uh, no, they didn't. But was it the four eyes approach restricted only to the APSOP facility or not? That the four eyes approach would be expected for any financial change. Do you know why this um, puts a different requirement or restriction on it, namely it's the use of the apps up um, that triggers the four eyes requirement? I think that's probably more bad writing than requirement because I hope further day, further down in the financial data bit, it does say, yes it does, the two man rule is used. You're looking under the heading financial data. I am indeed, yeah. Two sentences in. Yes, correct. Thank you. Can we move on um, still further, please, and look at um, FUJ 308 7154? Uh, this is um, a document which is described as a statement on Fujitsu re remote support, um, access to post office branch counters, written by Dave Hayward, a security architect within um, Fujitsu. Uh, do you recall Mr Hayward? I do, yes. Uh, where did he uh, work within the company? In terms of division or location? Um, both, please. Um, he was... Part of the architectural team, I'm f I think Dave was one of the exceptions who tended to work off-site. I don't remember him being in the in Bracknell building apart from coming down for meetings. So he's neither third or fourth line? No. He's um, architecture. Architectural, yeah. Um, you'll see from the bottom half of the page um, the distribution list. Um, it includes you, and you're described as the strategic support lead. What does that mean? 
I think it's just in, indicative of the fact that our titles meant, v meant very little and were at some times in, interchangeable. I don't know why Dave, Dave used that in that particular document. It should say SSC manager. It would be better defined that way, I think, yes. Anyway, uh, if we go over the page, please. Um, the document says, in the event this document is shared outside of uh, Fujitsu, it should be noticed that um, whilst Fujitsu endeavours to ensure that the information is accurate, it accepts no liability. It sets out the scope um, as being remote support access to branch post office counters under both Horizon Online and Legacy Horizon. I is that correct? Yes. And it starts with um, uh, HNGX. Um, if we just scroll down, please. Sorry, may I go back to where we were briefly? Yes, yeah, of course. Um, you said it referred to HNGX and Legacy Horizon. HNGX and HNGA. Ah, right. I, th I thought I heard legacy, but yes, so HN, HNGX and HNGA were later systems, yes. Uh, can we um, just then scroll down and look at HNGX? Do you see that it um, sets out a process um, that is used to access branch counters? Indeed, yes. Um, it says that um, the method is um, secure shell. Yes. Can you describe, please, um, to a lay audience, what secure shell was? Um, it enabled a technician to connect to and execute commands on a remote system over a secure encrypted connection it um, says that the server component resides on the branch counter and is provided by the sigwin open ssh server package what does that mean please um, sigwin was a package that could be used on windows platforms to enable unix like commands to be executed. So Windows and Unix being two different flavours of operating system. Um, it then sets out requirements, if we skip on a couple of paragraphs, to, the, to gain access to the branch counter. It says using the remote support capability, the member of staff must, and then there are a number of um, requirements set out, be a Fujitsu employee, have been security and financially vetted. Was that a new requirement, to have been financially vetted? Um, no, I think the financial vetting was the original level of vetting. No, I, I can't help with that. I, I'm, I'm, I'm struggling there. Okay, possess a two-factor author authentication token issued by security operations team. Can you remember when that was introduced? Uh, Two-factor authentication tokens were around from the very early days of Horizon. We used to use a token called a secure ID um, right back, I, I can't give you a date, but it was early in legacy Horizon. And in HNGX terms, there was a separate secure, a different secure token um, that was connected to uh, the PC in order to generate a, secure, a, a security, security token number. Um, just to be clear, the two-factor authentication token, was that just to um, get access to the system generally Mm. or was a special token required to be issued by the security operations team if you were going to 
um, uh, make um, changes to branch counters? Yeah, a, a token was re was required for any secure system access. So that would be ev anybody in the third line support group, anybody in Belfast or operations, people in other units uh, would have also had secure secure tokens if they needed to to access uh, the system in something other than a read only fashion. But there wasn't a special token issue. Not for this purpose. For the no. purposes of no. making alterations, I'm going to call no. it. No. Okay. Um, skipping a couple of paragraphs, um, have access to a branch support access private key. What does that mean? I don't know. Don't know, sorry. And just going back to page one. Um, and looking back at the distribution list, um, the second person to whom the document is said to have been distributed um, was Chris J, uh, who is described as defence legal. Can you um, remember who that was? And what defence legal was? Mm. I remember there was a period when there was some sort of legal oversight going on. I mean, Chris J was part of the Fujitsu legal department, as I remember it. I can't remember when his involvement started or, or why his involvement wasn't there. You said that you remember a period when there was some sort of legal oversight going on. Mm -hmm. um, legal oversight of what? I'm not sure. I just remember occasionally having to pass documents past um, Chris J. Documents about the Horizon system? Yes, indeed. Yeah. And what was the purpose of having to pass them past Chris J? Some kind of review. I unfortunately just don't remember precisely why he was uh, in uh, the loop for and some things. And it, you said that um, you remember that being at, at some period. Yes. Can you remember when that was? Unfortunately, no. No. Can we move on, please, to FUJ 308 7187? We've been previously looking at a document dated um, August 15. We're now moving, if we look at the foot of this page, to um, at the 12th of August 16. Yes? Indeed. And if we yeah. go to the top of the page, um, the heading is transaction corrections within repost-based horizon. The old... Horizon system pre um, HNGX was based on a product called Repost. The basic architecture was that each counter had a local database known as a message store. The data center had a number of servers known as correspondence servers, each instance of which managed a subset of the live branch estate. All accurate? Yes. Uh, correspondence servers contained large message stores which replicated to and from the set of counters the correspondence server managed. Thus, collectively, the central message stores would contain detail of all brand, branch direct, uh, transactions. Correct, also. Correct, yes. Uh, the old system harvested branch, uh, branch uh, transaction data from the correspondence servers, giving it an audit trail of all branch transactions. Is that accurate? Um, I was never supporting the audit part of the service, so I can't say for sure that it gave a an audit trail of all branch transactions, but I know that was its purpose. Uh, the replication process between the correspondent server message stores and counter message stores was two-way, so it was possible to inject messages into the central message stores, and these would be transmitted to the relevant message, sorry, counter message store. This was the process that was used to effect the equivalent of transaction corrections in Old Horizon. Does that match your understanding? It does, yes. Um, any such correction entered... Um, uh, this would be recorded with a node ID of the central correspondence server uh, greater than 32. Uh, can you explain what that means, please? 
Yes, as we saw earlier where the IDs and nodes within the branches would be one upwards. Um, correspondent servers were 32 upwards just to uh, separate them from the branch estate. Or sorry, make it clear that it was a correspondent server rather than a branch counter. And will be included in the standard branch audit trail, thus they are readily identifiable. The same technique was used to transmit other data from the um, centre to the branch. Um, any such correction would have been subject to an oper operational change process predating MSCs. Need to find some examples of some old OCPs and some view on how often it happened. Um, Steve Parker. Now, presumably you won't have seen this document other than for uh, preparing for today. That's, that's, that is correct, yeah. Can you remember the context why in August 2016 you would have been being asked for examples of um, OCPs, old ones, and a view on how often the process described there happened? I, I have to suspect in my mind that this was all t all to do with um, legal stroke litigation issues, but I don't remember the exact exact context of this this document. The um, sentence: all such corrections would be recorded with a node ID of the central correspondent server of greater than 32. Didn't we establish earlier that um, some corrections would have to be made using the branch counter ID? Uh, that's correct, yes. A limited, very limited a number had to be entered as if they had originated at the branch. Most would be able to be uh, executed at the correspondence server, but I can't remember or give you examples of which ones were which. So this is inaccurate to say that any such correction would be um, recorded with a node ID that would leave a, a footprint to make it readily identifiable as coming from the SSC? Uh, if it... I think that depends on your reading. My reading of it was that, as it said, it was possible to inject messages into the central message stores. It, that sentence was referring to, the, to messages injected into the central message stores. But I, I agree it could be read either way. Can we move on, please, um, to FUJ 308 7220. So we were previously in August 16, we're now in October 16, and this is um, an email chain in which um, you were um, involved. It's in relation to a Deloitte audit report, uh, an audit, I think, in which you were also involved. I believe I took part in it, yes. Yes, I think um, I've got a record of you being interviewed yeah, for, yeah. for it. Uh, can we go to page five, please? And um, we can see that this is an email from um, Stuart Hummy to Russell um, Norman, Dave Hayward, and you. Yes. And can you help us with um, who Mr. Honey was? Uh, Stuart was involved in, in, in the security of the system as well. I can't remember. Uh, I think Stuart was more on the development side than as opposed to Dave Hayward being on the architectural side. In any event, um, the, the email that's sent to you and others says, Hi, Russell. Um, I sent some information to Stuart Honey regarding this. Um, and then that's repeated. And I was not sure of the outcome after that point. Was this um, linked to the info Paul has collated for data flows?
Paul, Dave, Stuart, Appsup. Um, Steve raised the point about whether the process should be changed to match the designs or the designs changed to match the process, as in the attached. D doing the best we can of reading this email, you're reported, I think you're the Steve here, as saying, um, should we, is this right, write documents that match the process that we currently operate? Or should we change our processes to match designs in documents that we are to write? Is that right? Uh, yes, except documents already written, I believe. Ah. So some documents had already been written. I believe so, yes. That didn't match the process. Yes, I believe so. Can you recall in what respect they didn't match the process? Um, I mean, I looked at the information in my bundles on this whole app sub issue. Yes. I don't remember exactly how they didn't correspond to the actual process, but I know that the way that the SSC used AppSup at this time allowed any member of the SSC to, to escalate privilege uh, in order to make, to, in order to work on the system in a privileged fashion. Um, I believe the documentation said that um, any such changes in HNGX would only be done via a development provided script. It, it was around that area. I mean, the whole thing got extremely complicated and went backwards and forwards for some time. And so there's a debate really here whether the SSC should do what's in a written policy <coughs> or whether the written policy should effect be a in effect, be a person of reverse engineering to reflect sure. what it does in practice. Indeed. And what was the outcome? Um, as I remember, the outcome was that in order to uh, in order for the development group to provide scripted um, the ability for scripted changes for everything the SSC did, it became too difficult to implement for reasons of the logistics of people being available out of hours to approve SSC access and then make changes to the system in order to, el to allow a member of the SSC to elevate access or use scripts. It was there was a, it was more to do with we can't get in the right people on call to do this. And a, prag a pragmatic view was taken that since all SSC access via apps up in HNGX was audited anyway, the, a the existing methods would continue to be used. I think we can see your reply on page four. And if we scroll down, we can see that from you to Stuart Honey and others. Yep, this was a, and an you, earlier stage in, the, in that process, yes. And you say, in principle, I would prefer that we have this removed. And that was the, um, the this here was essentially the apps up access. The um, ability to raise our privilege to apps up level without any... Uh, auditable oversight. Thank you, yes. And you said in principle uh, you would prefer that you had that um, privileged access removed so that you could go back to the security model as documented. You wanted to do what the policy said uh, ought to be done rather than what was in fact being done. Correct, yes. Uh, but for pragmatic reasons uh, that was not possible. And I I do outline some of those, the uh, the issues that were going to be ex experienced further on there. How significant an issue was this? It went backwards and forwards for some time. 
Um, but it was, it's a reasonable example of the pure security view which says you just don't do this and the pragmatic view which says that was the, that was the only way we could uh, logistically manage the process. Can we go forwards, please, um, to a little later in October um, 2016, sorry, this is August 2016, to uh, October 2016, to FUJ3089535. Uh, you'll see that this is a formal uh, policy document setting out the high-level design for the remote access, secure access server, um, written by Mr. Um, John Bradley. And if we um, turn to page four, at the foot of the page, I think we can see that you're a reviewer. Uh, yes, whether I reviewed or not is debatable. That form of entry with uh, my name and the name of a, a member of the SSC afterwards, I was sent every document for review and I would farm those out to individual members of the SSC who would respond for me. I see. And... Um, we can see that the um, mark in brackets afterwards takes us to underneath 0 0.3 review details. It shows that it was somebody that actually returned a comment. Yes. Does that mean it was Mr. Breakspear that did so, or does yes. it mean that either of you and Mr. Breakspear did? Uh, I would expect that to 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 mean uh, to mean uh, to mean Phil did. By the, by that time, I was getting less and less technically proficient having been in a management role for longer and I didn't feel competent to uh, to actually comment on this kind of a document. Um, can we look at what it says is the um, formal policy by October 2016 um, at page 13 please and scroll down to 4.1.2 audit um, it states, although no active command logging or keystroke logging is done, we are keeping a record of people logged on to SAS server through double authentication and OS security policies for state servers. Um, firstly, the things that aren't being done, active command logging, what's that? I believe that refers to um, logging the commands being executed. Why that's been distinguished from keystroke logging, I'm not clear really. Are they um, essentially the same thing? Actually, probably not thinking about it. Keystroke logging, if you were entering data into a field in a form on a screen, then keystroke logging would detect as you enter keys 5, 4, 3, 2, etc. Whereas command logging would, would log the whole string that you put in after any corrections have been done. So it, on that example... So thinking about it, I, I, I can see why there is a difference there, yes. So um, in your example, command logging would just record that you had um, committed to whatever process you were undertaking, uh, the digits 54321 it wouldn't record that you initially typed 7, 8, 9, 10, deleted them, and then wrote 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, and committed them to the process? That's correct, yes. Okay. Um, why would um, command logging or keystroke logging be uh, contemplated for um, secure access to um, the live estate? 
uh, it gives a irrefutable record of precisely what was precisely what was being was was being was being executed, and in that way, um, it is entirely auditable after the event. It would be yes. In what sense is that um, a normal standard for um, the kind of remote access to financial data <clears throat> that we are um, speaking about here, uh, or to what extent is it a, um, a gold standard that's never achieved? Um, I don't know what the documented standards are, industry standards are in this area, so I can't be sure. Uh, can you recall um, discussion across the ages as to whether or not uh, active command logging and or keystroke logging ought to have been the standard uh, that uh, should be achieved? I don't remember dis discussions. It would be my preference for reasons we have stated, uh, we have stated previously. That, that it gives an irrefutable, irrefutable record of what's, what's been done. And so it was that um, even by 2016, um, despite um, the documents we've previously seen as to what had been proposed, uh, that this still had not been introduced? Uh, yes, that would be my reading. And had that been the subject of discussion and debate? No, but if I may, I will rewind slightly. Um, there was keystroke logging introduced as part of the SSH implementation that we've been looking at here. And I know for a period, keystroke logging did take place because I remember there being servers that contained the log data. At some stage, and I don't remember when, it must have come out of the system again for some reason. I have no recollection of when it came out or why. Who would have put it in and who would have taken it out? It was put in as part of the um, version of Horizon that we saw earlier when we were, we were talking about this was about the time of network banking. That's when it would have gone in. When it I, I believe, the more I think about it, it probably came out at HNGX but I'm not positive, not positive of that. So your best memory is between about 2006 and 2010? Correct. And can you recall, in general terms, the reason why, despite it being um, so obviously desirable, that it was not done? I can't really, can't really remember why now, no. Thank you. Uh, can we go to FUJ 0013-8382? This is exceptionally difficult to, um, to read, so I'll take it slowly. It's um, another work instruction. Can you see that? Yes, I can. Its title is the Apps Up Role. Yes. Uh, why was it described as a role? That was the term uh, used within the Oracle software that, that um, ran the database services. Uh, you, you literally called a command, set role, set role apps up. Okay. So, so it's not speaking about a person's role, it's speaking about a role in terms of a function that a system performs? It is, yes. Okay. Um, you'll see that you created this on the 31st of um, October. Um, again, it's had a later update um, 
at last by uh, Mr. Gelder, and we're looking at version 21. Yes. So again, we should bear in mind that not every word will be yours, and maybe none of them are yours. Um, can we um, see under the heading below is the historic process? It says the um, Horizon Security Design has two main groups with privileged access to the system. Belfast Operations for operational purposes and SSC for data correction and support. I, I, is that um, accurate, that there were two main uh, groups within Fujitsu who had privileged access to the system? Uh, yes. This privilege was deliberately split between the two units to separate the roles for security purposes and prevent a single point of failure. Can you explain how that... Um, how splitting, as it's described, operational purposes and data correction and support prevents a single point of failure? Um, if for some reason there was a disaster which rendered the SSC inoperable or there are network connections in, in to the service, into the service it like inoperable, then Belfast, Belfast like operations could carry out commands on our behalf or vice versa. It continues, uh, in each case the requirement is for a distinct privilege role that would only be used when suitable change control has been raised for audit trail, not authorization purposes. Can you explain what that means? It tends to suggest, does it, that the audit trail um, is the um, desired focus uh, for the change control process rather than actually being for authorizing the change? So that's a, a terrible question. No, I, I understand what you're saying. I think I think you're right, um, because the SSC were capable of doing a set roll apps up without authorization. Then that sentence, in some ways, makes sense that the the, the statement is being is being is being the way that you should raise the change control to make sure a record is being kept. D does it follow that the operational <coughs> change process was all about creating an audit trail and not about actually seeking authorization in each case? No, no. I mean, the change, con the change <coughs> control process was as much, for most purposes, was as much about the approval as about ensuring whatever was being affected was was and documented can you um, help us Th this is in within seven days um, this work instruction was raised um, of the um, formal policy setting out high level design for remote access um, to the secure access server Remember, that one was dated the 24th of, August, uh, of October 2016. And we're now right, on the, yes. the 31st of October 2016. What, what, why was it necessary in October 2016 to set out in a work instruction the historic process that had been followed years before but was now no longer followed? I don't know. I have no live recollection of it. At this stage, can you remember, was, um, were complaints being made and litigation contemplated? Um, Timing-wise, I would say that's possible, but I don't, don't remember that being the case here or a motivation here. 
I don't remember enough about it to tie that in. Can you think of a reason why a work instruction would be written in October 2016 that set out not a work instruction but um, an historic process in the past? Not really, no, because I mean, I would have ex I would have expected that kind of thing to have already existed. So I'm not clear why this is here in like, this form. And you, you um, wrote the document. <sighs> yeah, and I, I I just unfortunately just don't re don't remember what I was trying to achieve at that time. Do you think it was? Um, We've got a new document dated the 24th of October setting out what we're going to do in the future. But we need to reduce to writing um, what we did in the past. What we did in the past so that it's accurately recorded because we now know it's going to be the subject of questions. It's the sort of thing I can see my, my himself doing. I just don't remember it. Uh, can we go to your witness statement, please, at paragraph 72? Uh, which is on page 23. If we just scroll down, thank you. You say the SSC was hugely reluctant to change transaction data, as that was not our job, and we recognise the seriousness of doing so. Uh, why were you being required to change transaction data when it wasn't your job? If there was a situation where it was impossible for a... Um, change to be affected by the post office in order via a transaction correction or whatever other whatever other mechanisms they used then in rare circumstances it might be uh, it may be necessary for us to effect a uh, financial change I mean the the comment that it is not our job was uh, you know we would much prefer in all cases that financial in information was rectified by the post office and not us. Did you say you would much prefer in court cases? No, in in all cases. In all cases, thank yes. you. Yes. Why would you much prefer that? Because I don't believe that people who are who are supporting system should be responsible for uh, for making financial changes that's that's that is a business business position so whose job was it uh, I would argue that poll should be issuing some form of transaction correction for a postmaster's 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 account uh, why weren't they doing it uh, I believe there were some circumstances where it just couldn't be effected with, uh, with, the, with the, the tools they had. Is that because you um, controlled access to the Dominion that required uh, changing and that they um, simply physically could not do it? I believe so, yes, yes. At the time, did you um, express your concern that you were being required to change transaction data that wasn't your job? Um, that comment would 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 be made with the with the caveat that sometimes we just had to do it. There was no choice, but these circumstances were rare. You say in paragraph seventy two point four over the page that um, the lead up to this paragraph is um, 
in the rare circumstances where it was necessary to correct financial information on the system, we would dot 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 72.4 ensure poll and all the sub postmasters were informed by the service delivery team. Yes. How would you ensure that poll and the sub postmasters, uh, all the sub postmasters, were informed? By 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 giving the uh, necessary information to the service delivery team for like for for onward routing to uh, the post office or onward discussion with uh, the post office. And where you're referring here to the service delivery team, um, who are you referring to within Fujitsu? People's names or roles? Roles, please. It's, it's the uh, team I was referring to earlier in our discussion who had various service managers who would be responsible for different parts of um, the system and that could collectively be termed the service delivery team. Did you expect um, sub-postmasters therefore to be informed on um, each occasion that changes were made to um, financial data concerning their counters and their branches uh, to be informed that that had happened? Oh yes. So I wonder whether we could um, take the break now, please, until, say, quarter past three. Yeah, and how would you predict the remaining afternoon going? Um, so I, I've got um, another um, uh, topic, which is about 20 minutes to mm -hmm. cover. And then I think... Are there many CP questions? Um, uh, five minutes and two minutes, I've been told, sir. Right, so we're, we're well on track to finish, Mr. Parker, this afternoon. That's what it boils down to. Yes, thank you, sir. All right, fine. What, what time again, sorry? A quarter past, please. Yeah, fine. Good afternoon uh, again, sir. Can you see and hear me? Yes, yes, I can. Thank you. Uh, before we move to the topic that I said I was going to uh, move to, can I um, just ask you some supplemental questions on the issue we were um, just addressing and go back to paragraph 85 of your witness statement on page 31, please. So it's paragraph 85, and uh, you'll remember the, the one would have to concede sentence. And then you set out some controls against, um, that give protection against um, the um, errors or similar that you have identified as a possible consequence of remote access. I just want to ask you about the one you identify in 85.2. And so you say controls offered some protection here, and then 85.2, any such intervention would be with the sub-postmaster's consent, and the sub-postmaster would use system reporting to check that the results of SSC work were as expected. Um, dealing with the first part of the sentence first, um, any such intervention would be with the sub-postmaster's consent. Uh, are you saying that before the SSC made um, any um, changes to data um, any alterations or inserted messages uh, that was always done with the sub postmaster's consent? Mm. Um, I would probably have to amend that to say where the incident or originated from the, the sub postmaster, then clearly we would be in contact with him or her and would be um, dis discussing and uh, telling them we are effecting something for them. Uh, I think that I should probably caveat it in just that way. Just dealing with that caveated way first, being in contact with a sub-postmaster doesn't necessarily mean that you have their consent to make alterations to their financial data. Yes, Agreed? yes. So even in the cases where you were in contact 
in the SSC with a sub-postmaster, it was not the case that you always obtained their consent before alterations to financial data were made. Is that right? I want to say it's not right and that we would, we, we would always discuss with uh, the, the sub-postmaster, but I hadn't, I, there was no controls to ensure that was the case. Why were there no controls to ensure that that was the case? Um, the, they, again, change control would always be used, but that was effectively the only uh, control in that process. And change control was focused on the post office as an institution rather than the individual sub-postmaster knowing less still consenting to the change. Uh, that is true. That is true. But I would expect that whenever a member of, of the SSC was working on a sub-postmaster call, they would be talking to them as necessary and helpful to them. Uh, let's deal with um, the sentence without the, the caveat. In a case where SSC was talking with one sub-postmaster, but on um, examination it was found that the problem affected the financial data of 100 sub-postmasters, uh, those other 100 sub-postmasters were not contacted and not. said that there will be a correction made to their data. They wouldn't be by, by the SSC, no. Were they contacted by anyone, to your knowledge? In the case of a change of that scale, a, a the hundred um, sub postmasters. I mean, that would have gone been part of the problem management process. It would have gone through service managers. It would have gone through poll. Yes, and um, were you personally involved in uh, carrying out any of the communications back down to the sub postmaster? Um, I very rarely in that, in that did. kind of incident? In, in that kind of incident, I was not personally Were any of involved. your staff in the SSC involved? We're talking with one sub-postmaster. We've discovered that the um, bug affects 100 others. Mm, mm. Let's, in the SSC, contact the other 100. No, no. That wasn't part of the SSC's no. function? No, it wasn't. What do you know about the process by which those other 100 would be contacted? Um, very little. Um, I would have expected it to have gone through the post office in, I think, in all cases. I mean, we had, uh, we wouldn't phone up a large number of, su of um, sub postmasters ourselves. Do you know anything about a process by which sub, sub, sub postmasters? would be contacted by the post office to no. say a bug has been discovered, it's affected um, your data without your knowledge, a correction has been made without your knowledge? Uh, no, I don't know uh, about it, about like that sort of a process, no. Thank you, that can come down. Um, can we um, uh, turn to the topic that I wanted to ask about, which was um, the process by which um, Anne Chambers came to give evidence in the Lee Castleton case. Oh, right, yes. Um, you know that uh, Mrs Chambers gave evidence in the Lee Castleton trial in 2006. I do, yes. What was your involvement in the process that led to her giving evidence? Um, I don't remember being involved in the process of her giving evidence in any, subs in any substantive way. I may have helped in the provision of some information um, Information to who? Uh, to either Anne or the, the post office. Um, but it's Information about what? About the issue. Um, what was the issue? I don't remember e exactly the uh, history of that uh, particular incident. So when you say you may have been involved in giving information about the issue concerning the incident, do yes. you mean information about the... 
um, the sub postmaster Lee Castleton and the Marine Drive branch? Uh, yes, I, I I recollect vaguely um, being asked a few questions about it and filtering those aren't some of Anne's answers back. But why was Anne Chambers selected to give evidence? Um, because she was the person who had worked on uh, the problem. Was she content to give evidence? Um, no. I mean, sh she, as I remember, she wasn't particularly happy about the idea of giving evidence and the situation was somewhat forced on her. Who forced it on her? It was internal Fujitsu uh, politics. Uh, who were the internal Fujitsu politicians? I would have to refer you to, to uh, Mick Peach for that. I, I, he, was, he was manager then and, and I would have been the person who was uh, directly involved in it. Uh, why did she not uh, want to give evidence or why was she not con content that she should give evidence? My impression when I had the opportunity to talk to her was that it was the environment and the uh, stressful nature of the um, questioning process. So um, was it after the event that you learned that she yes. was unhappy rather than beforehand? Uh, fairly sure it was, yes. Uh, can we look at a couple of documents, please? Um, Poll 3070133. Um, can we look at the foot of the page, please? Um, there's an email from Mandy Talbot. Um, in Royal Mail to Gary Blackburn and others in Royal Mail and to Steve, a copy to Stephen Dilley. Um, Lynn, further to our chat, can you advise what are the names of the postmasters and addresses of the branches, if possible, of the following FAD codes? In February of this year, you wrote to Gary Blackburn and he wrote to Sean Turner and then Sandra McKay about these branches, which had apparently registered complaints about the Horizon system. Fujitsu have told us that in respect of Calendar Square, that there was a problem when the stock was transferred from one stock unit to another. But this would only apply when there was more than one stock unit, i.e. more than one position at the counter. Uh, did any of you find out what the problems were at the other branches and what did Poland Fujitsu uh, do to correct um, them? Can you recall your involvement in the um, calendar square bug? I don't recall. It was very little. Uh, can you recall whether that um, uh, suggestion there that the bug would only apply where there was m more than one stock unit, i.e. more than one position at the counter, is accurate or not? Um, no, but I've, I've watched Anne's testimony, so I, I, I saw what she said about it, but that would be, that's why I can recall something now, but only what, what she said then. Okay, and so if I ask you questions about that, you'd be replaying to us what you saw Anne say I last would, week? Yes, I would, yeah. Okay, can we go to the top of the page, please? Um... It is sent on to you, can you see? I do. By uh, Mandy Talbot on the 6th of December. Steve, I've copied you into this email to poll because it may be that you might have to do a repeat performance tomorrow once the FAD codes have been identified and the name of the branch is revealed. Incidentally, can you identify branches from FAD codes? As if so, this might give you a head start. But can you recall what the repeat performance she's talking about was? I don't know. Can you recall the context of this? 
namely Mr. Castleton raising the existence of the calendar square bug and you in Fujitsu being asked to investigate uh, its extent and the branches that it was said to have affected? Not really, no. no. Um, Stephen and Richard, our legal team at the court, will be doing their best to persuade the court not to allow Castleton, I think that's Mr. Castleton, um, to call this evidence because it is filed late and does not relate to the problems at his branch office. Um, if they are successful, there'll be no need to progress any further with these investigations. But as Castleton is a litigant in person, it's common for judges to be sympathetic and may allow him to rely on uh, his evidence. If so, you'll have to pull out all the stops to investigate what, if anything, went wrong at these branches and why we can distinguish them from Mr. Castleton at um, Marine Drive. Uh, can you um, recall what work you did, in fact, do to seek to distinguish what had gone wrong at these other branches and why um, uh, those problems had not afflicted Mr. Castleton at Marine Drive? No, I mean, I, I, I suspect that... Um from the date while this was going on, I was acting in some reason as sort of deputy manager while Mick may not have, have been there and I would have farmed that job out to some to somebody else to actually do, so I don't remember what was done. Can we see what I think is your reply at poll 3070135? If we just look at the foot of the first page and then the bit of the second page, we can see that this is your email. Yep. Yes. And so this is a reply on the 6th of December. You say, Mandy, as discussed on the phone today, uh, Calendar Square demonstrated a software problem with Horizon. The problem has been present prior to 2004. For an unidentified reason, Calendar Square was badly hit by it from September 2005. Problem was fixed during release S90 of the Horizon software. The incidents at Marine Drive show no symptoms of this problem. In particular, one, problem occurred when transferring stock between stock units. Uh, Marine Drive had only one stock unit, so couldn't do transfers. That's the point that Mrs. Chambers corrected last week. Yes. Um, two, problem caused an event storm with specific details. There were none of these at Marine Drive. Three, problem caused the receipts and payments mismatch, which showed on the cash account this didn't happen at, at Marine Drive. For these, did you conduct the investigation to um, highlight those three points? No. Where did you get the information from? I don't remember who I asked to do it. I would have expected if... Anne was about, I would have probably asked her because of her experience previously with that, with um, Canada Square, but I can't be sure. Uh, can we go to the top of the page, please? So you're not copied in on this, but um, uh, Mandy Talbot forwards your email to um, Stephen Dilley, uh, the Bond Dickinson solicitor, um, Richard Morgan, uh, post Office Council, um, Dave Holbert, who I don't know, and then two others within Post Office. Uh, she says, Anne Chambers conducted the analysis for Fujitsu. Does that help you recall what the content of your telephone conversation may have been with Mandy Talbot? Or might she have been talking directly to Anne Chambers? It's quite possible she was talking directly, but I'm not sure. Uh, Mrs. Talbot continues, she can give evidence on this. She will say that no problem has arisen with the Horizon system since Castleton was sacked, but will say that no um, serious problem have been elevated to their team to deal with. Dealing with those, um, but was it the case that no serious problems have been elevated to the SSC. I 
I'm assuming that's what was meant there, yes. Yes, was it true? I don't remember. Fujitsu say that this particular software glitch was known about in 2004, and the initial response to a problem by the help desk would usually be to suggest user error. Is that correct? The initial response of the help desk was usually to suggest user error. Um, I don't know what the what the uh, help desk was saying to the sub postmasters on this issue, unfortunately, sir. So. Uh, but if it continued, the problem had a pretty firm footprint, which could be picked up by Fujitsu. Further, this glitch is limited to counters which have more than one stock unit. And as Marine Drive had only one stock unit and the footprint did not appear, it can't explain Castleton's problems. The glitch would also have been observed as a mismatch in the receipts and payments records. This particular glitch was known to Fujitsu prior to 2004, and as such, it was one of the things which would automatically have been checked for by Fujitsu when conducting their analysis. Is that right? When um, individuals were being um, either prosecuted or uh, civil proceedings were being taken against them or civil proceedings were being defended, Fujitsu would conduct a series of um, checks as part of an analysis to see whether that branch was afflicted by known bugs? Um, I believe it was, but I didn't conduct, I didn't request any of those such things myself. Why do you believe that um, it was? Only because of my experience with what I've seen uh, during the High Court cases and things. People in your um, department, would they be involved in conducting this analysis to see whether the branch um, or the sub-postmaster against whom action was being taken, um, whether they or their branch were afflicted by any of the known bugs in the system? Um, I believe the process was by then that... Um, it would be Gareth Jenkins who was actually pre presenting the information to court. So we would be in the SSC providing him with the information he required. It would be him who did the analysis, witness statement, etc. But people in your team would be providing him with the um, evidence that he would give? We would be providing him with the raw data he asked for, yes. And what, uh, was there a written process? which says um, in the event of a, um, a criminal investigation, a, um, a prosecution or civil proceedings, these are the checks that the SSC must perform? Um, I wasn't aware, no, I wasn't aware of any such documents. Um, I also think it's worth mentioning at this stage that the data as used in court would have actually come from the audit system via an ARQ request. When the SSC was providing data, this would be for uh, initial analysis purposes. And so the data that the SSC provided to Mr Jenkins, was that for information only and he wasn't to use it as the basis to form conclusions? Um, Evidential conclusions? Not for evidential conclusions. There was something around the fact that all um, data that was to be provided for court cases had to come via an ARQ request and audit because there were certain uh, evidential chain of evidence rules. I don't remember the exact details. Uh, this email um, continues skipping a, a paragraph. Steve Parker, who conducted the investigation with Anne, did you conduct the investigation with Anne? No, I just think that was Mandy Talbot's impression because I was involved in uh, the phone calls and things. And so that's incorrect? I would say so, yes. Was it only Anne Chambers that conducted the investigation? Uh, I don't remember any substantive input on my part.
no. So yes, it would ha it would have been a. To your knowledge, was anyone else involved in the investigation of um, uh, Lee Castleton and the Marine Drive branch within the SSC? Don't remember. Uh, can we move forwards, please, to FUJ one three eight three eight six? FUJ 0013-8386. Thank you. Um, we'll see this is another work instruction. Can I just check the reference, please? That's 8367. I'm looking for 8386. Okay, that uh, doesn't appear to have been uploaded. I'll have to skip over those questions. Can we move, please, to poll 3099397? Poll three zeros nine nine three nine seven. So those um, two documents are unavailable. I will um, therefore have to ask any questions of Mr. Parker about them um, if and when he um, returns on the next occasion to give evidence. All right. So those are the only questions I ask. Thank you, Mr. Parker. I think it's um, Mr. Jacobs first. Hello. Um, good afternoon, Mr. Parker. Um, I represent um, 156 South Postmasters. Um, who instruct how and co. Um, and I have two questions for you. Firstly, this morning, Mr. Beer asked you about help desk scripts. Mm -hmm. And uh, you said they were written by senior technicians. Correct, yes. And what we're interested to know is, are you able to provide the names of those technicians who wrote the scripts? Unfortunately, no. I mean, uh, there was a number of people within the HSD who were considered more senior, but I very rarely uh, met them, so I don't remember those names, sorry. Are you able to tell us perhaps someone who might know, so we can ask someone else? Um, the only suggestion I would have on that is the current, well, current, when I was last working for Fujitsu, um, the service manager for that area at the time was Sandy Bothick. Sandy? Uh, Sandy Bothick. Bothick? Yes. Okay, thank um, you. So she would, she would have been around the HSD at, at, at that time. That's very helpful. Thank you. So the second question is a question you may already have heard, because it was a question that Mr. Steen uh, put to Mrs. Chambers last week. Okay. At the end of her evidence, and um, I wanted to ask you the same question. Um, so the question is, is during the evidence of this inquiry, Many of our clients, sub postmasters, sub postmasters, and sub postmistresses, um, said that their accounts, their branch accounts, never seems to balance. Um, and examples are Janice Adams said that uh, her branch accounts um, didn't balance, and shortfalls occurred on a weekly basis. And the weekly deficit was usually about fifty pounds, but higher on occasions. And she said she used to put these accounts routinely into the system in cash in order to continue to trade the next day. Mujahid Faisal Aziz says um, similarly that there were many smaller shortfalls, 
um, he would estimate on average 50 to 80 pounds shortfalls per week, which they always made good straight away, again by paying cash. Mm -hmm. Edward Brown said that similar matters occurred to him, and it wasn't always a large shortfall, but um, sometimes it could be in the thousands. And Gary Brown reported that the shortfalls happened so often that it was hard to keep track. Now, our question for you is, can you help us understand how it was that the sub-postmasters and mistresses experienced so many shortfalls? No, I'm afraid I can't. Um, without an investigation of of each of each of their issues because there were a, a number of different possibilities there. So, no, I mean, I can't explain why um, a large number of your uh, thy compliance have those issues. And, again, you know, the same point, um, would there be anybody else who you worked with who might be able to throw some light on this if, if you can't answer the question? can't think of anybody relevant for that particular thing. Sorry. No. No, well, that's fine. Thank you very much. I, I haven't any more questions. Hello. Um, I'd like to ask some questions about the overnight processes for checking for system errors. Okay, yes. And I understand that a uh, the program Tiscali or Tiscali was involved in that, is that right? Um, not aware of that name. No. Is it right that there were automated processes that checked across the estate for system problems? Yes. Uh, and would some of the system events appear on what's been called the NT event log? Um, yes, that would be one place where problems or notable events would be would be written. Yes. Is it right that um, some of them were particularly on the radar, as it were, at any given time? There might be a reason why you'd be looking out for particular uh, system events that might have come up overnight. Uh, yes, that would be true, yes. And is it right that you'd look on the, the event logs for that, perhaps the NT event log, but perhaps there are other ones as well? Uh, that wouldn't be a function the SSC would have performed, but yes, I mean, uh, probably the name we were trying to get to earlier was Tivoli. Um, Tivoli. And that would have been a function pr pr performed by the uh, estate uh, management team. So they would have been looking out for events of a certain nature and, if necessary, then raising incidents. Um, so if they raised an incident, that meant it would come through to SSC, is that right? Uh, potentially, but it, 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 it may have been uh, an event which indicated something which a different team needed to see. So it wouldn't necessarily always be SSC. If it was one that they knew was on the SSC radar, yep. then it would come through to you. Is, that, do, is that right? Yeah. Um, does, does, this may or may not still ring a bell, but um, does an event which said the hard disk has a bad block, does that ring a bell? Uh, it does. That would be in the legacy days generally because that was when uh, incidents of hard disk error actually caused problems with the repost messaging software. Right. So if you got that, it might mean that there was problems with the messages? It might do, yes. I mean, it wouldn't always do, but... And would that mean that would be a reason to flag it for the SSC? Yes, yeah. yes, I see. And so um, if, we, if we see that and we then see um, the SSC doing a remote reboot, is, would that be to try to fix that? Um... I would have thought a remote reboot would have been done by the event management team rather than us, but uh, that would be an attempt to fix that, yes. How, how did SSC go about doing a remote reboot, if I can just sort of try to understand that? Um, this is why I sort of said it would be the event management team. I believe an, a remote reboot was effected by a... Um, 
Tivoli script being fired at uh, the counter. So the SSC didn't use Tivoli scripts. This was this was uh, departments like the SMC who would have affected that. All right. So a Tivoli script can be used to do that. And in the case of a bad block, that would be an attempt to restore messages on the hard drive? Uh, it wouldn't be an attempt to restore messages. Um, generally, if I remember correctly, if you to reboot, if you rebooted after a bad block, it would trigger part of the Windows NT operating system to actually try to repair, repair the disk. And I believe that was why it was done, but we are out of my technical expertise there, really. Well, that's very, uh, that's very helpful. Is that likely then it might well tie into SMC doing something with replacing hardware if it failed? Uh, yes, it would, yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you. Those are my questions. So um, just before um, you release um, Mr. Parker, yeah. I wonder whether I could ask for your indulgence. The, the error in the two documents not being available to display is entirely my fault and nothing to do with the hard-working team that sits behind me. Uh, could I ask you um, just to rise for five minutes, please? We might be able to sort it out. The questions that I have to ask are less than 10 minutes. And just in case we don't um, call Mr. Parker back um, in phase five, it would be um, an advantage to him and to us if we um, got the questions out of the way now. Yeah, by all means, certainly. Um, so um, so we'll, we'll let you know when we're ready, but I imagine it'll be five minutes. Well, what I'll do is I'll stay close to my um, monitor. I'll actually switch the video off, but I won't leave the room so that you can just speak to me and I'll come back to life immediately. So Thank you, see. sir. Right, bye. Thank you. Oh, good. Can you see and hear us? Yes, I can. Thank you very much. Apologies uh, for that once more, and apologies to you, Mr. Parker. Uh, can we um, look at FUJ20138386, which is on the screen? You'll see that it's a work instruction written by you um, on the 8th of September 2011. The title of it is Providing Evidence for Police or Litigation Inquiries. It's version 11 and was last updated by Mr. Woodley in August 2021. Um, details. Um, any request for evidence supporting any form of litigation must be made via a defined route. That route is from the security department in Pol to the fraud and litigation service within the CSPOA security team. This is the only route that can be used for evidential purposes because the data handling conforms to the required legal rules for evidence. CSPOA security will make contact with the police and, if necessary, with poll lawyers. CSPOA security team may request that SSC staff provide some technical input to the process. CSPOA security do not notify poll as to who provides input into their general processes. Uh, they have confirmed that no member of SSC will be required to raise and sign any statements of witness as to their activity in such matters, and nor will any be pressure be brought to bear on SSC staff to do so. If a request is made for a statement of witness, you should immediately inform the SSC duty manager. Uh, and then there's something about um, physical hardware that I'm not going to uh, read. Why were you writing a work instruction in September 2011 about the provision of evidence to uh, the police um, or to poll? It must have been because it became clear to me that uh, requests of, of this sort were uh, being made without coming from the CS security team. And um, as I say there, that, that was the approved route and, and the only one which should be used for um, those purposes. Can you recall what had happened, uh, what event justified the writing of this work instruction? Uh, 
No, only that some sort of event of, of that type must have happened to trigger me to, to make things um, hopefully crystal clear. You see that um, it refers in its body to the CSPOA security team and CSPOA security. Yes? Yes, indeed. And that it refers to the fraud and litigation service within the CSPOA security team. For how long had the fraud and litigation service within the CSPOA existed at the time that you wrote this? Or is that a later author's work? Um, I think the fraud and, and litigation service responsibility that the that the that the CSPOA security team had always been there. I don't I don't re don't remember it it being something new. It was the means by 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 which by which evidence could be obtained and that was going on while I was uh, both the SSC manager and the previously. You see it's got a capital F and a capital L yes, on indeed. fraud and litigation, yes. which, which yes. might suggest a title to a sub-organisation within CSPOA security team. Am I right to draw that from it, or is that just a, a function that's being described, namely fraud and litigation service provision? I can't be sure if somebody's changed it afterwards. At m during my time, it was a function rather than a, than a separate service. We've heard from somebody called Andy Dunks. Did he work in that team? He did, yes. Uh, the work instruction says the only route, this is the only route that can be used for evidential purposes because the data handling conforms to the required legal rules for evidence. Can you explain what that um, sentence is meant to mean? Um, only the face value that it, it, that it gives you there. I mean, I'm not... Uh, I wasn't in any way involved with that process from for the CSPO POA sec, C, security team. Um, I was just aware that it had to be done that way. What had the requirement that there be a single route got to do with what are described as the legal rules of evidence? That was a, those words would have or that requirement would have been given to me rather than me understanding it and making it up. Was the concern about um, exhibit or physical security of evidence being passed from one person to another to ensure continuity, for example? I remember brief discussions about continuity of evidence and evidential requirements and just being told, look, this is, this is the way it has to happen. Or was it because the maker of the request from within the security team would know what those legal rules of evidence were? I would expect them to, yes. But I, I'm trying to discover what the requirement that this single route... Um, had as its raison d'etre? Was it because you needed to secure continuity or was it because the person making the request is in the know on legal rules of evidence and therefore any request should come t from them? It was the former in that we were, I was trying to ensure that the correct evidential rules were followed by the team who, who actually knew what those rules were. Was there any document that you were aware of in your time in the SSC that set out the legal rules for evidence to guide the SSC in the provision of evidence? No. The document continues, they, that's security, have confirmed that no member of SSC will be required to raise and sign any statement as to their activity in such matters, and nor will any pressure be brought to bear on SSC staff to do so. In the past, had the security team 
required SSC staff to provide a witness statement? That was, this was a reflection on the situation for Ann Chambers where she was required to, to provide a, a witness statement and that that, re, that resulted in a court, court, court appearance which she found stressful. Um, and this was a way of trying to uh, alleviate the fears of other SSC staff that they would be put into the same position. But five years had elapsed mm. between the Castleton case and uh, this work instruction. What prompted, um, after that five-year period passing, you to return to this issue? There must have been a litigation query or, or, or something which came in via the wrong route. I mean, presumably, um, the security team had required SSC staff to provide a witness statement. Otherwise, the record of a guarantee that they wouldn't would be unnecessary. <laughs> That may have been the may have been uh, the case. All I can remember is something definitely happened to, to trigger me to trigger me actually writing it to uh, attempt to a define the route clearly and b put SSC staff's mind at rest that they wouldn't find them themselves in a courtroom for just helping the security team with a few bits of advice and guidance. And I'm trying to discover what the trigger was, given the only one we've identified yeah. happened five years yeah. before this document was written. Sorry, don't know. In the past, had the security team brought pressure to bear on SSC staff to provide a witness statement? Um, not during my tenure. I don't remember that going on. I, I do remember the situation uh, with Anne Shavens and Mick, but uh, that's the only one I clearly remember. Thank you. Can we move to the second document, please? Poll 3099397. Um, this is an email exchange involving you in 2013. Can we pick it up at the bottom of page three, please? And scroll down. If we look at the bottom of this page, page three, um, we can see um, an email from Andrew Wynn to you of the 16th of July 2013 at uh, 16.01. Um, Hi, Steve. Would you be able to assist with this one? I've been trying for months to get the referral uh, info from the raw logs as per Gareth's advice without success. Ironically, I've had a subsequent challenge from, some details are given, is this something that can be relatively easily pulled within the six-month window when detailed data moves into archive? Appreciate um, any help. And then um, you um, reply at the bottom of page two, please. Um, Andy, initial information on Gilmerton shows that the transaction was a referral still working. And then you put a note. Um, note, not trying to teach you to suck eggs, but thought I'd remind you that none of the information we dig out for you like this can be used in litigation. Anything required for evidential purposes must come from the litigation support team. So does that um, reflect the work instruction that you had raised a couple of years earlier? It does, yes. And why were you including that warning to Mr Wynn? Reminder only. I mean, I wasn't sure how Andy intended to use the information he, uh, he, he 
What was I asking you for? And then if we scroll up, please. Um, I think that's all I need. Uh, it is all I would pull if it was three months. Good point about litigation. I'm aware that any evidence we put in front of a court must come through the right channel. I'm dealing well before this point, but I have to be aware that any case may end up in court. I will typically say something like, I've asked Fujitsu to investigate, and they have confirmed that a referral was made to your Horizon system. So something like that might get waved around in court, but the transactional data presented would need to come through approved channels. And then if we look at your um, reply at the foot of page one, scroll up a little bit more. And if we scroll on, please. Sorry, scroll up, please. And scroll down. And then keep scrolling. Yes, it's at the foot of the page now. The litigation bit, thank you. The litigation bit is all to do with chain of evidence for prosecutions and delivery in court. I'm sensitive about it because in the distant past, one of my colleagues was persuaded uh, by our side, not yours, to write an, evi an evidence statement without fully understanding the implications. As you know, our professional witness for these type of cases is Gareth Jenkins. But in this case, because process was not followed, uh, Gareth couldn't do it, and preparation for court became very um, difficult. Um, is that paragraph a reference to Anne Chambers and the Lee Castleton case? It is, yes. You say, in the distant past, one of my team was persuaded by our side, not yours. You're here corresponding with Andy Wynne of the post office. Correct. And so our side means Fujitsu, it, your side means post office. It does, yes. Who in your side had persuaded Anne Chambers to give evidence? I don't remember... Uh, I don't remember the name. It was... It was the somebody in the security team, but again, you'd have to ask uh, Mick Peach. I mean, he was uh, privy to that. I wasn't. You say that she was persu persuaded to write an evidence statement without fully understanding the implications. What were the implications that she didn't fully understand, to your knowledge? My... That was the... Imp Implication of having to having to having to actually stand up in court and face some questioning. So your your understanding was she didn't know that if you provided a witness statement, you might have to come along in court and speak to it. I don't think that was made clear. That was my understanding, but this is all this my knowledge of this is coming second hand from Mick in majority, apart from the odd time that I talk talk to Anne about it at uh, the time. You continue, as you know, our professional witness for these types of cases is Gareth Jenkins. But in this case, because process was not followed, Gareth couldn't do it. And preparation for court became very difficult. What was the process that ought to have been followed, but which was not followed? I don't remember. And I find that sentence strange because my recollection is that Gareth Jenkins started fulfilling that that role after Anne Chambers uh, found as her found herself having to give a witness statement. So I'm not I can't think now why I made uh, that statement. That's what I'm exploring with you. Um, why was it that in the Lee Castleton case, Mr. Jenkins couldn't do it? because process wasn't followed? Uh, I don't remember. And that would have been, as I say, Mick, I should think, doing that at, uh, at that time. In what way did preparation for court become very difficult? I don't remember. Can you think back and try and assist us? <sighs> I'd, yeah, I'd like to, but... but 
most of my my knowledge about what happened in that sit situation came either from Mick or Anne in com conversations I had with them. I didn't actually, I wasn't actually there for like, taking part. So sorry, I just don't remember. Thank you very much, Mr. Parker. So those are all of the questions that I ask. Right, well, thank you, Mr. Parker, for coming to give evidence, and thank you for making a witness statement. Um, it's possible, as you've heard, that um, you'll be asked to return, probably in some month's time, if you are asked to return. And if you are asked to return, uh, a, a request for information, a Rule 9 request, will be sent to you so that you know uh, what it is that you have to address your mind to. All right. Understood, yes. Thank you again. So, so right. we're t 10 a.m. tomorrow for Mr. Ismay. Yeah, fine. All right, then 10, 10 o'clock tomorrow.